My name is Yukon Huang. I'm a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment Asia Program. And first, let me thank all of you for trudging down here on such a cold day. This is going to be a what I call a, a very complicated uh, discussion today. Let me start by noticing how much times have changed. Go back to 2010. China grew by 10.3%. That was good news. China accounted for half of global demand in the midst of the financial crisis. So everyone thought that was actually a very good thing. China grew last year at the rate of 7.7%. If you pick up the newspaper today, many articles will say that the good news would be if China's growth rate actually declined rather than rose. So what is different today? And what is different today is that China has a massive debt problem. And for many people, dealing with that debt problem to reestablish sustainable growth means that you have to compromise on the growth objective. And that good news would be that growth this coming year and next would actually be lower. Lower about how much we don't know, but lower. And that higher growth actually would be bad news. Now, the complicating factor is China's third plenum. This came out in the fall. And as many people have noticed, it potentially is transformative. If it is actually implemented, it can actually change the nature of China's economy over the coming decade and next. So what I want to do today is to talk about the third plenum, and look at implications for growth and debt and the future growth path of China over the remainder of this decade. Now, the third plan is a very complicated document. If you look at the decision note, it's 10 pages. It's 16 sections. It's 60 issues. How does one digest something so complicated? And I'm going to try. I'm going to say to you, it is as easy as one, two, three. And my talk about the third plenum is to categorize that as one, two, three. The third plenum is about changing the way the economy is governed, the governing structure of China. And it consists of one principle, two groups, three themes, and two tools. And the principle is that the market will be decisive. And to make sure it works, there will be two leading groups, one dealing with security, one dealing with the economy. And you're dealing with three major themes. To unify the urban and rural areas, to restructure the state enterprises, and to realign the relationships between Beijing and the provinces. And to do that, you have to revamp the fiscal system, and you have to rationalize the financial system. So let me go through... The third plan, one, two, three, plus two tools. The first one is the principle. The market will be decisive in setting key prices, allocating resources, while the government's role is to complement the market. But this principle requires sound institutions and competitive markets. This is not the case yet in China, especially for what I would call the three key factors of production, capital, land, and labor. Until you get sound institutions, competitive, competitive markets, these three prices remain or will remain distorted. And the big challenge in China is, how do I get to that point? Now, people think when they, about the market being decisive and setting prices, they're thinking about outputs, commodities, energy, the cost of food or manufactured goods. That's not the issue. It's capital, land, and labor. Two groups dealing with security and the economy. Why these two groups? And the first is dealing with security, and they create a National Security Commission. And the second is dealing with the economy, a leading group to deal with economic reform. And many people think that security, the immediate perception was they must be talking about foreign security the South China Seas, the relationships with the neighbors, nuclear issues. Not really. It's domestic. Now, why is it domestic? It's because of 
the rise in mass protests. 160,000 incidents of mass protests a year, increasing exponentially. The cost of dealing with mass protests, mass incidents in China, now exceeds the military budget. The world is worried about the military budget, but they need to realize that actually China spends more in dealing with domestic security than it does with external security. And this is, of course, a big issue for the party. The economy. If you survey Chinese, excuse me, they will say that they're much better off than their parents, the highest in the world. That's a Pew survey. Now, some people will say, Chinese are always optimistic. They always out, come out with positive statements. But if you actually look at this question this, in this Pew survey, five, six, seven, eight years ago, China was actually not at the top. It was actually in the middle. So the same question is getting different responses. Nevertheless, many or most Chinese feel that their lives are better than they were, but many are still very unhappy because of inequality and the nature of the growth process. Security growth, the two leading groups, and the fact that Xi Jinping is the head of the two indicates how important it is in China. Now, there will be, actually, analysis coming out about whether Xi Jinping being the head of both groups is actually a good thing or a bad thing. Because if you think about it, it's kind of strange. He's already head of the country. Why does he need to be head of these two groups? What is the significance of him actually becoming head of these two committees? And that's, again, a very complicated issue which still needs to be developed. The first cross-cutting theme. You need a better managed urbanization process to promote productivity and urban rural equity. Now, China is in the midst of a very rapid urbanization process. That's this red line. This blue line is what urbanization would have been in China if they had not controlled the location of people. And people cannot move easily in China. So traditionally, China has been under-urbanized, but it's rapidly catching up. And this is the trajectory. A better managed urbanization process will maintain the speed, but do it much more efficiently. And we will see later that that is part of the story as to how China can grow faster in the coming decade, or at least be able to maintain the growth rate that it currently has in a more efficient way. But the big controversy in China will be, where do those people go? And if you look at the third plenum documents, it talks about the fact small cities, secondary cities, open them up, let people come. Large cities, be a little bit careful, but strictly limit the size of the mega cities. And my point here is that I actually don't agree with that view. China's mega cities, the Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, Wuhan, Shenzhen, Guangdong, Chongqing, Chengdu, the mega cities of 10, 15, 20 million, I think they need to continue to grow. Now, people think that's crazy. You have cities which are 20 million. How can they be bigger? Won't they be more polluted? Won't there be traffic congestion? Well, the reality is people forget this is a country with 1.3 billion people. It has substantially less arable land than the U.S. China's megacities need to be bigger. And if they were bigger, they'd actually be less polluted, less congested, more efficient. And if China's going to be a high-income country, the high-value service jobs are going to be in these big cities. So a big tension in the coming years is where will these people go? And can they go to the big cities where productivity is the highest? And can China reap what I would call the productivity gains needed to become, in some ways, a more equitable society. That's the first theme. The second is the role of SOEs, the role of the state. China has been very successful because it has allowed competitive pressures to drive the economy. This makes it different from the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. It makes it different from India. Where do these competitive pressures come from? First, globalization. China competes with the rest of the world. That competition with the rest of the world is very, very strong. 
The second competitive pressure is regional competition between the provinces. Each of the 25 to 30 provinces and major cities, they compete with each other. Now, if you look at the Indian economy, they neither compete globally, nor do the major states in India compete with each other in the same extent that China does. So China may have weak institutions. They may have lots of inefficiencies and problems. But the power of competition keeps China going on a relatively efficient growth path, which is not true in many other developing countries. But where China fails is the competition between state enterprises and private enterprises, which are weak. And this is the agenda for the coming decade or more, to maintain the competition between, or to increase the competition between the state and private enterprises. Now, why is this becoming so important? This is the rate of return or profitability between state enterprises and private firms. And this is private companies, the black line. The red line are state enterprises. The gray line is the average. Now, many people don't realize it, actually. But state enterprises, the profitability, the efficiency, the return, actually was increasing as fast or even faster than private enterprises for the last 10 or 15, 20 years until the global financial crisis. And by this point here, around 2007 and 8, the difference in returns between private enterprises and state enterprises had narrowed to only 1.5%, which is insignificant. And it's particularly insignificant because the state enterprises are concentrated in activities which inherently have a low rate of return, the heavy industries, the utilities. So for all intents and purposes, by 2007, the performance of state enterprises and private enterprises were actually roughly the same, despite a common perception that the state must be much more inefficient or must, has, must have a lower rate of return. But something happened. Something happened during the crisis, and you can see the returns to the state enterprises almost collapsed. The private enterprises took a little dip, but then continued, and the state enterprises have not actually caught up. They've actually not rebounded, and the gap today is six or seven percentage points. It's enormous. Used to be one, one and a half. It's four times as much. The reliance, the pushing out of funds during the fiscal stimulus in 2008 fundamentally changed the financial performance and relationship between state enterprises and private enterprises. And this is going to be a huge challenge in the coming years if China wants to get back to a sustainable growth path. So this is the second theme. Third cross-cutting theme. Very little attention to this theme, but it's actually the most important one. This will determine the way this country operates. It's the relationship between Beijing and the provinces. And this is unique. This actually explains how China functions. You have a regionally decentralized administrative structure and it's designed to support economic and political objectives. Beijing sets the objectives and targets for each of the provinces. It appoints and rotates local officials to achieve national objectives. Their performance, their regional performance, shapes promotion prospects. So someone like Xi Jinping goes to Fujian. He goes to Shanghai. He goes to various provinces. He does well. He becomes the president. The next potential successor is now in Guangdong. He used to be in Inner Mongolia. If they do well, they're assessed, they get promoted. And what are they assessed on? Economic targets, political. Now, the economic targets are easier. Grow, invest, trade, do various things. And there are known policy instruments. Prices, incentives, whatever, credit. The provinces are encouraged to experiment, and they do, because they want to achieve better. And the success is easy to measure and reward 
And there's a feedback loop between Beijing and the provinces, which is relatively efficient. And this helps drive the economy. And since your senior officials, the party secretary, the governors, the major mayors, they all don't come from the province. They come from outside the province. They get there and they're there for three or four or five years. And if they do well, they leave. And it's fundamentally a structure you don't see in any other country. The political objectives are more abstract. Maintain peace, security, stability. Keep the people happy. How do you do that? The uncertain policy instruments. You don't really know how to do that. But stability is paramount. The key thing in China is maintain security, maintain stability. So Beijing exercises what I would call conditional autonomy vis-a-vis the regions. You out there, the party secretaries, the mayors, the local officials, I'm going to watch you. Try to achieve these objectives, but if you don't do it well, I'm going to do something. And the normal way that officials at the local level respond is what I would call a combination of concession with repression. Now, remember, there's 160,000 incidents of mass incidents a year. Mass incident is, is defined as two or three or four or five people protesting or more in some way. It could be trivial. It could be serious. How do you deal with this? And most of the time, the local officials deal with it with a mix of concession. What's your problem? Let me solve it. You have a wage complaint. Let me raise the wages. Your land has been grabbed. Let me sort it out. But you don't want to encourage this. So every time you have a concession, you also have a repression. Somebody goes to jail. Somebody gets punished. Mix of concession with repression. And the last thing you want is that the issue is escalated to Beijing. And it happens. Through the petitioning system, through people come, that's a problem for the center. And this insulates and protects the center. Now, this system has worked extremely well for three decades. It's managed very good economic growth. It's managed to contain and maintain relative political stability, but it's under stress. It's under stress because on the economic targets, growth investment for the sake of growth and investment is no longer acceptable. You have environmental issues. You have equity issues. You have sustainability issues. So these targets are being modified, and they are being put out in a different way, and people are going to be assessed differently. But whether you can achieve it or not is not clear. So this is a new system. And the politics of the system is changing. This has not been able to contain the incidence of mass arrest. The costs have increased dramatically. The pressures are going higher. And most importantly, the senior leadership in Beijing are increasingly being drawn into incidents at the local level that are potentially have risks to the state, and they've increased. And whether it's a Boshi Lai affair, or Chen Guangzhong in Sandun, or a village in Guangdong which wants more representation, the center is being drawn in. And how this relationship between Beijing and the localities is handled will actually determine the governance structure of China in the future. Instruments, the budget. If you go through the third plan decision, what you will notice is enormous amount of attention on the budget. And I mention that because when you go through the financial pages of the newspapers, very little on the budget. It's all about banks and financial sector. But the third plenum gets it right. It realizes that the major problem in China is the budget. And the budget is extremely small, relatively speaking. Here is an economy, a country, state-owned, land, major resources. Everything is owned by the state. The government provides a range of social services which exceeds normal. They have to do everything. They have to basically respond to everything, much more than a market-driven economy. Yet, China's budget as a share of GDP is very low, much lower than OECD economies, and much lower even than middle-income, upper-middle-income economies. And the expenditures on social programs is very, very low, relatively speaking, to the size of the economy. And because the budget is lower than normal for a country that you'd expect the budget to be higher than normal, you have a big problem. And the big problem is that you fund everything through the banks. 
So the banks are actually your budget instrument, and that shouldn't be the pro- way it is, but that's the problem. But you can't solve the banking problem unless you solve the budget problem. Now, why can't you solve the budget problem fairly easily? And you cannot because the structure of the budget is messed up. The taxing power is centralized largely at the Beijing central levels. The local levels have relatively less taxing power or sources of revenue. But the expenditures, who spends the money, is largely at the local levels, the county level, the prefecture, the provincial. The center doesn't really have much expenditure responsibilities. This blue, this is the expenditure responsibilities. But the center collects most of the money. So you have a very funny system. Those who actually spend the money don't get the money. Those who get the money don't spend the money. And you have to fundamentally restructure the fiscal system, who collects the revenues, and who's responsible for services. And you have to do this for a budget which is actually too small. So this is a major problem that's going to take the rest of this decade to resolve. With Ah, got it. Now, this is the guts of part of the debt problem in China, the local government debt problem. You read about it in the paper. The local governments are in debt. They're building all sorts of things that aren't needed. They're developing land in the rural areas. This is driving the farmers off. This is leading to ghost towns and cities. So what has been happening in China? And if we understand this diagram, we understand the nature of the debt problem in China. Here's the local government. This local government doesn't have enough tax revenues, as we just indicated. It doesn't get enough money. It has to provide social services. Where is it going to get it? What they've been doing is creating what is known in China as local investment companies, local government financing vehicles. And they give these vehicles some money, and they give them land. And this vehicle can function because it becomes a company, a corporation. Whereas the government can't borrow, this vehicle can borrow. So it borrows money from banks by giving them collateral that the government has given them and gets money. It borrows from financial intermediaries, gets money and gives them shares and bonds. And then it builds transport, energy, water, and housing, spends a lot of money. But critical to this relationship is land. If you don't have land, you don't have collateral. So what has been happening over the last 10 years? Land speculation, land sales, land development. And that's the only means because you don't have the taxing authority or powers that you normally have. You don't have property taxes. Your income taxes are almost nil. Your sales taxes are already so high that people are evading it. So the only means of getting money, of getting money if you're a local government, is through land sales. And it becomes excessive. And then the land prices go up the sky to go through the roof, and you have a property bubble. And these entities, what are they, what are they building? What are they financing? Infrastructure, housing, water supplies, very little revenues. They don't pay off immediately. How can they service their debt? They cannot. So you hear about local government debt build up to very sizable portions. This is the fiscal problem. Misallocation of revenues and expenditures at different layers. No way to control or unbridled speculation occurring because of the structure of financing expenditures at the local level. Financial reforms. Enormous agenda here. You need to promote competition between banks, between state banks and state banks, between state banks and private banks. But your banks are too large and they're too dominant. You need to strengthen capital markets, equity markets, bond markets, very, very small in China. You need to eliminate the bias favoring state banks and borrows, and you have to improve the regulatory system. And you have to have a capital market. Capital markets will allow the formation of more flexible, but not necessarily higher interest rates. Now, most of the time, when you pick up the financial pages, it's talking about the banking sector needs reform, but it's talking about interest rates. And practically every article will say that interest rates in China are too low. 
And this leads to all sorts of problems. But the reality is interest rates in China are actually too high. They're not too low. The problem in China are the banks are too dominant. Compared to any other country, the size of the banks, the deposits in the banks, the lending of the banks, the credit flows of the banks in China way exceed norms. And we now know why. It's because the budget is too small. If the budget were actually sensibly sized, the banks in China would not be playing such a dominant role, and much of the financial stress you see in China would actually be contained. But many people then, however, focus more on the interest rates. These are one-year deposit rates. I live in China a portion of the year. I have a bank account in the Bank of China. I have a bank account in the Bank of America down the street. I put all my money in the Bank of China in Beijing. I get three and a quarter. And my money is essentially insured 100% because it's a state bank, totally government guaranteed. And then when I put my money in China, I get it in renminbi, and the renminbi is appreciating. So why would I put my money in the Bank of America, which pays me 0.05%, insures me to 100000 or plus, The dollar is diminishing in value. And if you look at it, China's interest rates, deposit rates, lending rates have been free, but deposit rates are controlled. China's deposit rates are quite high, and they're even quite high after you account for inflation. And then if you take exchange rates into consideration, it's really high. No wonder, therefore, that more and more money is moving into China because of high interest rates. Yet, if you pick up the newspaper, every article will say interest rates in China are too low, they need to go up. And then they argue that if you liberalize rates, or if you sort of like free up rates, they will go up. And they will. And they will go up because China's financial system is distorted and repressed. But suppose China fully liberalized. They let money flow wherever it wants to flow. And people all of a sudden are allowed to move money in or out you will then see that China's interest rates will actually fall because China is connected to the global financial markets and it makes no sense for savings rates in China to be over 3% and savings rates in every other major financial center being less than half a percent, especially when exchange rates and interest rates are, are at play. Another major issue that needs to be addressed, but not so obvious, China invests a lot, 47% of GDP. It's gone up an enormous amount. But not that many people realize that the increase in investment rates, the share of investment in GDP, is very much geographically located. It's all occurring in the interior. This is the investment, regional investment share of GDP of the western provinces, This is of the coast. And if you look, the surge in investment over the last decade, all of it was in the interior. It's not alone the Shanghai's, Beijing's, Guangdong's, but the press makes you think it's that way. After all, those are the major trade centers, the industrial centers. But it's largely in places like Xinjiang, Gangsu, Qinghai, Sichuan. Is this a problem? It is a problem. It is a problem because the rates of return, the investment efficiency, as measured by the i Now, the i is the incremental capital output ratio. High is bad, low is good in terms of return to investment. The i for the western provinces are fundamentally higher than along the coast. So you invest more and more in the interior, but you're getting lower returns. Now, The interior, as a consequence, is starting to grow faster. It's growing faster than the coast. No wonder more and more investment is going to the interior. But the returns to investment in the interior are much, much lower. So when you look at China overall, you see a declining efficiency of investment. But you have to realize it's very much a regional or spatial issue as opposed to the efficiency of the country as a whole. 
This is a major issue the government has to decide. A policy designed to promote more equitable distribution of income between the coast and the interior also has a very negative impact in terms of lowering rates of return for the country as a whole. And you can see the consequence. Roads can have a high or low return. Here is a major highway in Xinjiang. There's no traffic. They want four, lane, four or five lane divided highways, but there's very little traffic. Here is a road outside of Beijing, 60 miles outside of Beijing. Total concentrated mess here. This has a very high rate of return if you can build more roads and solve it. This has a very low rate of return. And as you push out more and more infrastructure in areas where there's no demand, you get a lower rate of return. Will the third plenary reforms change perceptions about China's unbalanced growth? The standard concept of China is consumes too little, invests too much. And you can see it in the historical decline in consumption as a share of GDP and the rise in investment as a share of GDP. And it really zooms up during the stimulus program. Investment zooms up and consumption declines. If China implements the third plan reforms, will you see a more balanced growth process in China? Because if you pick up newspapers, 90% of them will say the major problem in China is its unbalanced growth. Consumption share is too low. Investment share is too high. And the answer is no. If you look at the decision note, there is no mention at all about imbalances or unbalanced growth. It actually gets it right. It says that our goal is to have the proper relationship between consumption, investment, and trade. It doesn't actually say that this is too high or this is too low. Because urbanization, if it's done well, actually leads to more unbalanced growth. So if China continues to become more urbanized, you will see that as a natural consequence of the process that this consumption that this consumption share of GDP will actually stay low. You'll see that China's growth path, it's designing, it's declining consumption of share of GDP, which has been happening for 20, 30 years, is essentially the same as Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore. They all have this declining consumption as a share of GDP, and then it flattens out. Now, the interesting thing when it flattens out, the so-called balance period, Let's note a few things. That balance period stays relatively level for decades. It's not like it bounces back up, become balanced, and you get balanced significantly. You don't actually. It changes very little, which it flattens out. China is just starting to enter the balance phase, but it hasn't really quite reached it. Next slide. So why does urbanization... Why does urbanization cause unbalanced growth? You have a farmer, let's say, in the far west, and he produces rice worth 10,000 RMB. He spends $1,000 for seeds and fertilizer, and he nets 9,000. He consumes 7,000. He saves 2,000. This is a typical farmer, actually. It's actually the typical numbers for a farmer. He now moves to Guangdong. He works for Apple producing iPods. Apple pays him 30,000 RMB. Three times. And that's the urban-rural income differential. Urban income is a three times rural. They bring in parts and components, and they produce an iPod with value added of 60,000. So wages here are half of the value added. And of this 30,000, this farmer now consumes 15. 50%, which is the norm, and he saves 15. Now, this farmer is deliriously happy. He used to consume 7,000, he now consumes 15, more than twice. He used to save 2,000, he now saves 15. But labor share output. Labor share output goes from 
9,000 out of 10,000 to 50, 30,000 out of 60. Consumption as a share of GDP goes from 70%, 7 out of 10, to 25, 15 out of 60. Now, here's an interesting phenomenon. This is what's been happening for three decades. A farmer leaves, his income triples, his consumption more than doubles, his savings goes up sevenfold. The company makes a fortune. The country grows at 10% a year. But consumption as a share of GDP falls. And after you have 250 million migrant workers moving from rural to urban areas, you have the steady decline in consumption as a share of GDP. You have unbalanced growth. Nothing wrong with this. Yet everybody writes and says unbalanced growth in China is bad, that consumption is repressed. How can consumption be repressed if his consumption more than doubles? Why is he better off if he's able to save seven times as much as he used to be? And why is the company any worse off? They get this good labor, they pay them three times, but they're very productive, and they reinvest and invest, and China grows at 10% a year. This process has not stopped. It's going to continue under the third plenum which means that unbalanced growth in China will actually continue or even get worse. And you will pick up many articles where people are saying, are they rebalancing now? Is it going to happen now? And the answer will be, if they are successful, if they do it well, no, it won't, and it shouldn't. And there are many articles which say China's growth must be more consumption-driven. How can growth be more consumption-driven when it's already growing more rapidly than any country in the world. Consumption in China in real terms, real terms is growing at 8% a year, 11% nominally, nominal terms, built in prices. Think about the U.S. Here we're wrestling with whether consumption will increase at 1% or 2% a year in real terms. Consumption in China is growing at 8%, four times. Yet people will write and say, China needs a more consumption-driven growth process. It just doesn't make any sense. But that's what you'll read. But what can the third plenum reform really do to change the nature of China's economy? And that is, it needs to promote urbanization, and it needs to increase the share of services in the economy. Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. They are the path that China's on. This is their urbanization lines during their critical development period. What you see is a very rapid urbanization, which then levels off. And they all level off. Japan here, Korea and Taiwan later, as you would expect. When this line levels off, growth becomes more balanced. That consumption investment share flattens out more. Here's China's urbanization line, way down here. It's got a far ways to go. You will not see balanced growth in China until this line starts to level off. Now, why is it that urbanization, when it levels off, you start to get more balanced growth? It's the service sector. The growth of the service sector and when it starts to reach its maximum. Because services is more consumption-oriented. Services does not require as much investment. Services generates high-valued wage jobs. But China's services, as with its urbanization, is really too low, and it's been repressed for decades. So the critical issue in the third plenum also, can urbanization increase rapidly enough? Can they reduce the restrictions and regulations which prevent services? Can they get to a path which looks more like this? And if they do... China's economy will become more balanced, but sensibly so. Next. Debt. This is what markets are fixated on. China's overall debt as a share of GDP soared with the stimulus and continues to increase. So many people are predicting, or some people predict a crisis, but many people say to deal with this debt, you have to basically slow down the economy You have to cut off the credit supplies. Let's look at the composition of this debt. Household loans, consumer loans, 
the property bubble, the residential thing. Three years ago, when you pick up the paper, everybody said financial crisis in China because of the property bubble, the housing bubble. Prices are too high. And they all felt that way because they had the memory of the United States in mind. The crisis here was housing-driven. But the housing bubble, the consumer bubble, the household debt issue is not really an issue in China. Then you have the central government, the government debt, this little line here, this little 22, the shaded area here, it's not an issue. Central government debt in China, very, very small GDP, much smaller than other countries, is not the problem that you see in Japan or Europe. Local government financing vehicles, that has jumped up. But as a share of the total debt, despite all those borrowings and infrastructure buildings and everything we've read about, it's actually a very small percentage of GDP. It's also not the source of the debt problem in China. This increase in debt in China is in the corporate sector. So if there's a vulnerability, if there's a financial problem in China, it's going to be in the corporate sector. And there are people starting to write about it's not local governments, it's not central government, it's not households, not the property bubble, it's the corporate debt. It's very, very large. And then because it's very, very large, and because it increased so rapidly, China's going to have to collapse or will collapse, as did Malaysia or Thailand or Korea or Japan 20 years ago. But there is a difference here, actually. This corporate debt, go back. This corporate debt is not the same kind of corporate debt that we know in the West. And the first reason is a very large chunk of this are state enterprises. Maybe 60 or 70. And some of these are state utilities, the railway corporation, the power sector, the heavy industries. Some are what I would call more normal kinds of industrial enterprises. But their liabilities, their risks, are not what I would call normal corporate risks. They are essentially the risk of the government. So much of the corporate risk debt in China needs to be looked at as a state debt risk and not a so-called corporate risk debt. Let me go further. Next. A lot of articles talk about shadow banking. Now, shadow banking is essentially defined as loans which do not go through the banks they go through other corporations, their equity financing, their bonds. They're sort of like companies which use banks as conduits and pay them a fee. Shadow banking consists of all these colors, and they become large, and they only emerged in the last four or five years. So many other articles will say, well, the risk is going to occur because of shadow banking. Normal bank loans, this dark blue, the normal kinds of bank issues, They've actually declined as a share of GDP. So the financial crisis in China is not a crisis of what I call normal banking form. It's a crisis if there's a crisis in terms of the growth in shadow lending, which actually don't use the banks or they use the banks as an intermediary. Now, the word shadow banking immediately generates a view of problems, risks. China... Shadow banking is an issue because we know very little. And we also realize that risks are greater in this economy than other economies because people don't quite know what's going on. It's not very transparent. But shadow banking exists everywhere. And shadow banking dominates the lending in the United States. It's the lending that goes through corporates, financial houses, the insurance companies, private equity funds, everything else. Shadow banking as a share of GDP in China is only one quarter that in terms of the size of the economy as it is in the West. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't a risk. It means that emergence of shadow banking is actually an indication of what I would call a breakout of financial and diversified products in China that is now and has been existing in the West for a long time, but it's riskier because people know much less about it. But its size actually is actually quite small relative to the size of the economy. So this is going to be an interesting question, but the nature of the risks 
are also not fully appreciated or understood. Next. China's debt problem is high. High because of the corporate increase, but largely state. But China's debt as a share of GDP is much lower than developed countries, but much higher than developing. And this is very difficult to evaluate. Is China's, do you see China as a developed country or do you see it as a developing? Clearly on per capita income terms, it's a developing. But in terms of many other structures, it's more like a developed. And this also makes it very difficult to assess risks in China. Next. If you look at the analysis of all the major investment banks and financial centers, the general conclusion is rapid debt rise is a serious but manageable concern. And the reason why it's manageable is it's largely domestic. They don't borrow externally a lot. It's backed by enormous reserves, $3.8 trillion. Enormous amount of household deposits, one of the highest in the world in relationship to lending. And it's supported by trade surpluses. If you look at all the other countries which had financial crisis and had a real problem, they don't have any of these characteristics. They're running trade deficits. They're borrowing a lot overseas. They didn't have a lot of household deposits. The local level government debt is a problem. It's increased dramatically. It has to be curtailed. It needs to be dealt with. But it's also, in terms of the size, actually not a big issue. Shadow banking is a risk factor. Very little known. It needs to be better regulated. It has to be contained. These things are all problems that need to be managed, but probably are manageable. But to make it manageable, you have to grow at 7 8% a year for the future. Because if you don't, then the interest burden, the problems become very hard to deal with, these issues. So the tricky issue is, can you do it? Can you achieve 7 8% reforms? Reforms. Can the third plenum do this? Next. And here's the issue here. When you put out money in the system, when you lend a lot in China, in the past, you got a lot of growth. This is the growth impact of credit. The ratio of credit divided by real GDP. Low is good. When China pushed out money in the past, spanned liquidity, spanned loans, it got a fairly big bang in terms of GDP last three, four, five years, it pushes out credit, the growth impact is not very substantial. So here's the problem. More and more lending, more and more debt leads to less GDP growth in the past. So one thing basically is less need to put out credit, but you have to deal with this because you're not getting the major impact. So big question is why, why is it that the pushing out of money in China in the last three, four, five years has not led to an increase in output that occurred in the previous decades. And I'm going to come to this, because this reveals, I think, a really interesting question in China, which hasn't actually been fully understood. Next. And the really interesting question is, money's been flowing out. It's been invested, but it doesn't need the growth. And the answer is, there are two definitions of investment. Economists have two definitions of investment. One is fixed asset investment. One is gross fixed capital formation. Now, you out there probably think, what's the difference? They sound the same to me. Their investment is investment. This includes the value of land and property, transfers, but nothing real. This takes it out. So this is what's called real capital formation in the economy. And they used to be essentially the same the growth path, but they diverted in the last three, four, five years. Public investment growing much faster, much higher than fixed capital formation. Now, fixed capital formation is the concept that shows up in GDP accounts. That's growth. So the money that's been pushed out into China shows and pushes up investment, but it doesn't generate the same bang for the buck in terms of gross capital formation. And the answer is price of land. The price of real assets have zoomed. And then the interesting question is, is this good or bad? I have an apartment in Beijing. 
bought it in 2006. The value is increased fivefold. Now, if I had to go out there and get some credit to finance it, I'd show up as a huge credit or a huge debt. Is this a problem? Well, is it a problem if my apartment fivefold stays fivefold? Now, here is the issue in China. For two and a half decades, when you didn't have a private property market, the value of land and real assets was unknown and hidden. Now that you have a private property market and land is being traded, the value of land and real resources in China is now becoming realized by the market. And the big question is, is over-realized or, regu- or appropriately realized? Suppose it's appropriately realized that land in China and Beijing, these major centers, should be the price it is. Then all this credit, all this money that's flowed out there, no problem. It's just realizing the intrinsic value resources in China, which were repressed for decades. And then you're on what I call a more normal path. But suppose it's a bubble out there, that all this money out there, all the prices of the land are overstated. And sometimes it's going to adjust, it's going to come down, then you have a problem. But really what's happening in China, money is going out, it's spending on land. Remember all that local governments, remember all the property. It's being spent in land and buying land, developing land, transferring resources. And in some ways, it's actually what I call the deepening of the financial system or the money in the economy rather than what I call distortion. The distortion was in the past. It was all repressed. It's now becoming revealed. It's like discovering a hidden Mona Lisa in your attic. Before, before, I know, before, no value to anyone. You find this Mona Lisa. You put it up for auction. Somebody pays $60 million for it. This is not, by the way, real investment. Nothing's changed. It's always been there, right? But now it's been realized. So the bank gives you a loan for $60 million. As long as that Mona Lisa is worth $60 million, it's not a problem. But it doesn't show up as GDP. And this is happening throughout China. And it's going to be interesting because what it means is going to be hard to say. Now, productivity. This is the productivity increase in China. This is the increase in public investment or, 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 or excuse me, increase in fixed asset investment. Most people don't realize this because there are tons of articles out there which say, Productivity is declining. Return to capital is declining. Efficiency of capital investment is low. Most people don't realize that the productivity return to capital was actually increasing all the way up to the global financial crisis. It was not declining. It was actually increasing despite ever-rising investment levels. And then it collapsed during the global financial crisis and stayed down. So the problem, the return to capital, the efficiency issue is largely a global financial crisis issue but not necessarily structural. Next. It's okay. All right. Can the third plan reforms increase productivity and growth? Yes. Shift more resources to the private sector, more efficient urbanization process, restructure the regional investment strategies, less for the interior, more for the coast. You do these three things, and you can add one to two percentage points to China's underlying growth, its underlying growth is what it's actually intrinsically growing at now without stimulation, and that's 6.5%. That's why the growth rate is constantly sort of like inching down or seems to be falling, because it's still being propped up by excessive liquidity. Its real growth rate, if you strip it all of that, is 6.5%. But if China can introduce these reforms, it can add anywhere from 1 to 2 over the next several years. And that's why I think... The growth this year and next will be 7.5%. And two years or three years down the line, it'll be 8. That's assuming that they implement the third plenary reforms. I've talked too much. Sorry about all this. Let me stop here and take questions. Okay. Yes. Right. Putting in jeopardy the provincial investment units and also the state-owned enterprises. Correct. Could I draw you more? Okay, let's, let's look at that. You don't agree with that. No, I don't. The, the issue is 
what, do we, what do we think a true equilibrium interest rate is? What is a real market-driven interest rate, right? You liberalize interest rate controls in China right today, and that's the only thing you do. You just free up the deposit rate. Lending rates are already free. Deposit rates are not. Deposit rates will rise. That will happen. It will rise because the system is all screwed up. It's a repressed system. State banks have easy claim to household deposits because they have all these guarantees. They got all these things. Private banks do not. They have a hard time getting deposits. They will bid up deposit rates in a repressed system. So the pressure will be for it to go up. Now, let's talk about a fully liberalized, unrepressed system. The literature shows that under financial repression, when you liberalize it, rates go up, but then they go down in a fully liberalized system. You open it up to the outside world. You let money flow back and forth. Okay? Everybody in the world will start moving the money to China. I get 3.5% there. It'll be flooded with money. Why should I put and get it in the West and get 0.1%? Now, what will companies do? Suppose you're big state Chinese companies with good credit. Right now, if you're borrowing in China, you pay 7, 8, or 9%. I pay 6 or 7% for a mortgage loan in China. I pay 3 to 4 here. Why don't I get my mortgage money here? Lending rates are much lower in the West than they are in China. If you have this arbitrage, and it's already happening, Chinese companies with international branches are borrowing overseas because they can get money at 3, 4, 5%. Why should they pay 7, 8, or 9? Companies which can get into China in some ways to get 3.5%, they're already starting to do it. That's why you see reserves of 3.8 trillion now. They're coming in because interest rates are so much higher in China. If you have a fully liberalized system, you allow capital to move everywhere, and you change the structure of the banks, China's interest rates will fall. They have to be. You can't have one economy with interest rates of 3 to 4 or 5% to savers, and the whole rest of the world, it's less than half, less than 0.5. doesn't make any sense. Correct, but that's why I'm talking about a true equilibrium market rate. If I sort of like truly liberalized and have an equilibrium market driven, China's rates have to fall. And look at it this way. China saves 52% of GDP, invests 47 48%. It saves more than it invests. It's very strange. It invests an enormous amount, but saves even more. What do we know about interest rates in a true theoretical, hypothetical sense in terms of equalizing savings and investments. If savings exceeds investment, interest rates will fall. Because in every other country, it's the opposite. They invest more than they save. (laughs) But China saves more than it invests. And it will fall until it equilibrates. So it's true. If I just liberalize one rate and keep all the distortions, all the restrictions, all the biases in the system, rates will be pressed. It would be just like a distressed bank out there in Washington. If, I, if they're under heavy pressures, having problems, and they need money, they'll go out and bid higher for savers. They'll go bankrupt eventually, but they'll do that because otherwise they have no choice. They can't compete. In a repressed system, you have all these kinds of distortions. Okay? Yes, Peter. Uh, a comment Sorry. and a question. Uh, huh? First, a comment. Oh, excuse me. A comment and a question, first a comment. I agree with almost everything you said. You've offered significant insights into the question of the capital markets, labor markets, land markets. Uh, I'd like to single out one that Mm -hmm. is the frequently focused on question of China's low consumption rate. You are completely 100% right. It's unfortunate that there is so much misunderstanding of that issue, including amongst some of your own colleagues at Carnegie. Now my question. Um, On the corporate debt, that is what we need to focus on. Mm. Now, you try to convince us that we don't have to worry too much because a very large part of this huge corporate debt outstanding is, in fact, government debt government corporation, railways, and so on. Right. You estimated, if I understood you correctly, 50 to 70%. But that still leaves you 30 to 50% non-state off a huge amount. 
Correct. Is that a risk? How much of that part of the corporate debt is purely private and property related, as I believe a large part is? If it is indeed property related, how vulnerable is the whole system to a sharp decline in property prices? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, let's suppose let's suppose that forty percent of the corporate debt is private. There have been, at least I've seen three or four, detailed studies of the profitability returns and cash positions of private companies, listed companies. All those studies basically show that their profit rates and positions are relatively strong. And it goes back to that diagram where I showed you the rates of return on assets of private and, and state. The private ones are pretty, pretty strong. Now, most of the studies have a problem. They can't get into the smaller unlisted companies in the private sector, of which there may be vulnerabilities. But I see no particular reason that those smaller unlisted companies are financially vulnerable. Partly the reason is they don't get much debt. They have to depend upon internal surpluses and savings. They don't borrow from the system. Likewise, when there's a debt problem, they're not the same indebted because they never had to. Now, among the state ones, what we don't know is the distribution of that debt. Is it all the steel sector, the cement, the railways? And, if, and the answer is a large chunk of it is, but not all of it is. Okay. We also don't know how much of that corporate debt actually isn't corporate. It's actually local government financing vehicle debt because every local government financing vehicle has to become a corporation. And China's debt statistics are a little bit messy. Now, other people have now begun to realize that shadow banking and the way the central government has been classifying this debt, that there is a significant amount of that which is double counting. How much we don't know. So some of our colleagues in the IMF are actually going to get into this question. How much of that debt actually there is actually double counting? It's really much lower. So in a nutshell, private sector micro details don't reveal significant risks. State sector differentiate risk. But there is a risk there. A certain amount of this kind of debt out there is going to go bankrupt. And the question is, it's largely going to be a state problem. So what will happen in the end is that the government share of debt and GDP is going to rise significantly. Now, there are studies out there which show that increase to be anywhere from 2% to 10% of GDP as sort of like possible maximum burden that has to be taken over the next 10 years. And I think that it is a problem, but it's not a, a collapse problem. It's a hemorrhaging problem. It's a phasing. It's a, it's a management. It's very, very messy. Where is a good example of China's risks? It's not Thailand or Malaysia or Japan. It's actually the former Soviet Union. Because the former Soviet Union, the debt was internal, was largely government. You couldn't find it. It collapsed. It collapsed in 92. It collapsed because despite growth of 10% a year, investment ratios of 45 to 46, it turned out that much of the production of the former Soviet Union was non-viable. It was not competitive. It couldn't actually exist. China is actually saved because most of its production, most, not all, is pretty efficient or market competitive. That differentiates it from the former Soviet Union. But like the former Soviet Union, its debt, the contingent liabilities, the hidden responsibilities are not so transparent. So there is a risk out there of unknown nature. Vikram? Thank you very much, uh, Vikram Nehru from Carnegie. Uh, thank you very much for this excellent presentation, uh, Yukon. Uh, I'm glad you raised the point about double counting of debt, because when you put up that debt slide, mm. uh, you take these local government financing vehicles, they borrow money and they lend money. So their debt is actually, which are their liabilities, are counterbalanced by their assets. And so the debts of the corporates are partly because of lending from the local government financing vehicles. So there is definitely double counting when it comes to the LGFVs versus corporate debt. And there, it, it doesn't completely alter your story, but there is definitely double counting, and I suspect there's double counting elsewhere in that slide as well. But my question to you is, I don't understand this point about an underlying growth rate of 6.5%. Could you elaborate a, a little bit sure. more on that, please? Thank you. Okay. 
China is growing at 7.7. .7. It's been coming down from 10.3, 9.2, 7.8, 7.7, and it still has pressure. It seems to be still going down. So for many people, the question is, is it artificially being propped up? If you didn't prop it up, what would be its intrinsic growth rate? What's its sort of like potential? Commensurate with productivity and demand and what's going on. In my own back of the envelope calculation, that growth rate is about six and a half. That about one percentage point or more of GDP is still leftover vestiges of past stimulus. It's the continuing expenditures and investment of local governments and corporations, which shouldn't occur, but they do because they don't want to stop production, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why I go down to six and a half. That's why I still think there's pressure on the growth rate to come down. And every couple months, the government sticks, does something to try to push it up there. So I still think it has room to go. Look at it a different way. What's the intrinsic growth rate of the economy if I break it down to components? It's essentially the growth of consumption, the growth of investment, and the trade surplus. Consumption is about half of GDP. Consumption was increasing by 8.5% a year for a long time. It's come down to about 75 intrinsically. The growth of households, consumption, the growth of government consumption. Investment is close to 50% of GDP. It was growing about 10, 11, 12% a year for decades. It's coming down. It's coming down closer to 7 or 8. It's probably going to come down a bit more to 5 to 6. Suppose that trade is neutral. China does not generate either a trade surplus or a deficit. Essentially, growth is the growth rate of consumption and investment. One thing is growing around 8. The other one's growing around 6 or lower. It's coming down. If they're growing at 8 consumption, 6 investment, that's 7%. If it comes down a little bit lower than I think it is, you're getting down to 6.5 or maybe even 6 now, I personally feel that the intrinsic growth rate in China right now, if you didn't do anything, is like 7% consumption and 6% investment. That's 7 and 6, each is 50, 50, 6.5%. Now, can it come down to 3 or 4 or 5? Suppose investment collapses. You get zero growth in investment. But consumption continues at 7 or 8%. The economy will still grow at 3 to 4. But, of course, consumption won't grow at 3 to 4 if the economy collapses because households will change their behavior. So that's not, to me, a viable scenario. But could it go down to 5 or 6 slowly or hemorrhaging if the government doesn't do anything? And the answer is it could. So I, I, I would not be surprised if growth hit 5 or 6 with no reforms. But suppose you start reforming. Suppose more money goes to private enterprises. More money is available to the coast areas rather than the interior. You urbanize and allow Chinese migrant workers the rights to buy land, housing in the cities, access to social services. I had a slide which showed you that migrants save half their income. They're making fairly large salaries in these cities, but they save half. Normal Chinese save a quarter of their income because they have to spend housing, education, schools, boom, boom, boom. Migrants cannot. Suppose you allow migrants the same rights and privileges as ordinary Chinese, and they actually saved only a quarter of their income and not 50%. Growth would go up by one percentage point of GDP. 1%. A whole 1% just by that. You add that to the efficiency of these other factors, you get potential growth of 1% or 2% fairly easily. Now, why say fairly easily? None of this requires money. Hard stuff is when you have to spend a huge amount of money to get some growth. Easy stuff, if you liberalize and allow forces to spend or do something efficiently, and it actually doesn't require any more money. And the answer is, in China, many of the reforms don't require a lot of money, yet they generate growth. So a mix of sort of like growth-enhancing reforms doesn't have a huge credit need. You could actually grow fairly well, but they're not easy to do. They're politically sensitive. It's really up to the government to figure out whether they can handle this. Yes? That's what I, I wanted to get into following up on your last point, is that a lot of what you've suggested 
requires the government opening up, like letting more migrants, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but all the indications to at least to an outsider like myself is they're trying to open up the economy, but they're making very clear that there's going to be no opening up on the political side. And I know you're a, not a political scientist, you're an economist, right, right. And, and this has been a fabulous presentation. But do you want to venture out a little out of your comfort zone to get into that uh, aspect of it? Can, can you go back to that slide with the central local? Okay. This one, uh, more here. this one here. I wrote an article for it. It's in SICE Journal. It's also in the Foreign Affairs. Because I was struck by this question as an economist. Why is econ economic liberalization in China proceeding relatively fast and well and doing very well, but the political liberalization in China was essentially stagnant? The basic structures of what's going on in this country hadn't changed. I'm not a political scientist. So I was looking at it as an economic issue. And what I realized was that these actual two, these links are interlinked. For, Chinese, for China, the political targets of stability required what I would call tight controls, stabilities, repression, concession, conditional autonomy in order to get the maximum growth product out of China. To allow you to allow China to experiment, to grow, to do it handily, easy. This has been the this is the China model. Now the question has now is, can you maintain this objective here, while leaving this relatively constrained or repressed or controlled? And if you read my article, you'll you'll say you'll see in there. I don't think so. And I look at it as an economic issue. When the numbers of mass incidents and repression or acts increase so dramatically, the economic costs are enormous. So what's got to change? But it's going to change, but it's going to change starting at the local levels. People are, I think, making a mistake because they look for this change at the very top. They're trying to look at it in the standing committee. They're trying to see the actions of the senior leadership. I think it's going to be the relationship between Beijing and the localities. Because China cannot afford to have a complicated, large economy moving forward and trying to micromanage or handle it from the top down as it has been in the past. So liberalization, political liberalization, in my view, first of all, is going to occur with the local level in the relationship between the senior leaders in Beijing and the local officials. And the question will be, how do you deal with this issue? So I do think there's pressure on the system. And I think there's a couple of things you're going to have to ha that will happen. You don't want protests. You don't want appeals to Beijing. That's ri too risky for the center. That means you're going to have to basically say or allow local officials to deal with these issues more. You have to give them the flexibility. Because if they can handle it, it will not lead to a, a protest. It will not be escalating up, and that's what's been happening. So you're going to have to see signs in terms of what I would call greater autonomy between the people and their local representatives in some way. You're going to have to see changes in the court system so that don't have a protest, take it to the courts. But people don't take it to the courts now, of course, because they don't see the courts as an unbiased, neutral player. The pressures in the system, if it works, has to force these kinds of changes at the local level. And then if it forces a change at the local level, suppose that the village head, who is now duly elected by the villagers, and they want him to do something, and he can't do it. So the protest is getting serious. And he now goes to his boss up the higher level and says, I have a problem. I got a protest. I got people. They want me to change something, but I can't do it because of this or that. Can you help me? Can you change it? Can you do it? Because if you don't, it's going to get escalated to you and becomes your problem. Because if I don't satisfy it, they're going to kick me out. That, to me, is the nature of the change in China that's going to occur. But I'm not a political scientist, and I can't tell you the speed. But I see it coming at the local levels. And you can start seeing it at the local levels in certain ways. The people who manage or control incidents of mass protests at the local level have changed. They're no longer the security apparatus. It's become the party officials of a different form. It's actually mirrored at the top. 
why is Xi Jinping ahead of the security group? That group in the past would have been headed by the standing committee member dealing with security and discipline. It isn't. It's now being dealt with by the senior and most party officials. That is happening at the local levels too. Because there is a recognition that that political liberalization, security, stability issue needs a broader view of its implications for everybody. Now, whether that leads to what I would call a process of evolution, I don't know. But this is why I think this is actually the most important change in the third plenum. Because if you read it carefully, you'll see indications that this is what has to change in China. Next question. Back there. Hi, I'm Dan Moore at the Center for Global, for Global Development. Thank you, Yukon. Very interesting. Uh, in the third component for increasing growth going forward, it was restructure regional investment strategies. And I take that to mean shifting money back toward the coast, away from the interior and the west where it has been less productive. But my understanding is that the, the increase in investment in the interior and the west was driven by the political imperative. And why will that political imperative become weaker? I mean, is it feasible to actually, from a political perspective, have that restructuring of the investment strategy? This is a political issue. If you go back and look at the surge in investment, it begins around 1999. And you go back and look what happened in 1999. Develop the West. So China said massive investment into the 12 defined far western provinces, infrastructure, environmental, services, they reform, everything. Dramatic shift. And then develop the northeast. Then the center rising. All these regional programs. Now, what they did was basically say that if we have to push out money, or if we have to do something, the system makes it easier to spend money in the interior than it does along the coast because they could justify it against these rural development or these regional development programs. Now, initially, these had what I would call a good impact. They build needed infrastructure. They focus on environmental preservation. They restructure state enterprises. They had a long-term payoff. But this is continued. And then during the global financial crisis, a large chunk of the money went to these same kinds of areas and programs, and I would say that was overkill. Now, you look at GDP accounts, you see some very positive things. The far west is growing faster than the coast. The center is growing faster than the coast. China's regional inequities are moderating. But this is a huge, heavy cost. How can you do it, therefore? How can you achieve the same objectives at lower cost? And the answer is you can. And you can by focusing on social services and environmental investments in the interior and not trying to increase production. You can focus on not trying to build five-lane highways, but smaller highways that actually serve people a bit more. And you can, if you can educate and help the people more, the ultimate solution is, frankly, they leave. They go to areas where there are more jobs. One of the things you see in China is a disproportionate amount of so-called directed investment goes to smaller and medium-sized cities as opposed to the megacities. Therefore, if I have to spend money, it's easier for me to get approval to spend it on a smaller city because the rules say it's fine. And secondly, the government wants people to move to these places. But the reality is people don't move to these small towns. They can't find jobs. They want to go to the megacities. So you have a kind of a funny problems. You put your money in areas where you think you'd like to develop, they're backward, they're retar- they have problems, but they have low productivity, they don't generate jobs, you waste money. You're better off letting them leave. It'd be like in the United States. Do we develop West Virginia by investing in West Virginia, roads, highways, industries, or do we develop West Virginia by educating everybody in West Virginia and telling them to leave West Virginia? In the United States, you can never get away with it. What governor of West Virginia will say, my platform is I will educate all of you and you will leave. And those who return will have bigger farms, bigger lands, nice ecotourism, and they'll be well off. And those who leave will be better off. Now, ideally, an economist would say, that's a great model. 
But politically, it's untenable in the U.S. No governor is going to say, like Detroit, I'm going to save Detroit by basically closing it down and you all leave. I'm not going to save Detroit by more investment, attract more people in, boom, boom. That's what we have to do. Now, China actually has it a little bit easier because its governors and state party Congress people don't stay there forever. So yes, so there is a political issue, but it has some potentially uh, policy implications which could actually improve the situation. Any more? Madam, and then here and then there. Please. Hi. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. I learned a lot, actually. And um, I'm just curious to know your opinions on the uh, planned establishment of 12 more free trade zones other than Shanghai. And uh, do you think it's going to incentivize China to um, grow more rapidly? And do you think the um, interest rate liberalization could be realized only within those free trade zones? Mm. Very good question. Free trade zone in Shanghai focused on financial services um, and not so much geared toward trade production commodities. The free trade zone concept for Shanghai is an excellent idea, but its success will be reflected in the fact that it doesn't exist. Okay? What do I mean by that? Suppose you say in Shanghai, well, Shanghai, money can move freely in and out easier than elsewhere. In Shanghai, services will be less restricted. I can show all the American movies that I want. Unrealistic, of course. You don't expect everybody in the country to go to Shanghai to go to a movie. And if I can send out $100 million from a Shanghai bank easily, it's not too hard for me to move my money to Shanghai and send it out. So why do I bother? Therefore, if you actually have the same kind of a model, 12 more places, 20 more places, 100 more places, then I think this particular idea has done its job because essentially it's not Shanghai anymore. It's everywhere. You cannot have a physical zone trying to pilot transactions which have no physical space. So I think it's a great idea in the sense of saying, how do I actually try to liberalize this? And then finding out, of course, that it's not restricted to a particular area. It's actually something you should do everywhere. So start off and find that out. Then find out you should be done everywhere. And then pretty soon, there is no special zone in Shanghai. There's no special zone anywhere. So I think this is actually a good idea, but success will be measured differently. Next. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you. Shayan from Chinese Embassy. Thank you for your kind presentation and your positive idea. But uh, my question is about the service industry. Um, we do know that the service industry share uh, is not so high as that in developed countries. But uh, from your point of view, mm -hmm. um, how about that currently, what's the barricade that has affected the industry development uh, in China? Um, do you have any idea about that? Uh, we all talk about to develop more industry service, uh, service industry, but how, how can we develop that? What kind of service industry we may focus on will be the right thing to choose at, at, uh, at this moment? And uh, from the skills development, do you have any suggestion on that from your experience? Thanks. Okay. Services in China are, are, relatively speaking, low. Now, they're around 42 or 45 percent of GDP. They probably should be closer to 50 or higher. Why has it not been increasing very rapidly? One, as I said before, urbanization. Urbanization, although it's been increasing rapidly, it's repressed. 52 percent of the country is urban. It probably should be something like 58, 60 now. It's going up to maybe 70, 75. Now, why does urbanization have such a major implication for services? Because services flourish when there are a lot of people. When you have a lot of people concentrated, they need services. But what China needs are high-valued services. The jobs that generate salaries of 10,000 RMB a month, not the jobs which generate three or 4,000. Now, it turns out the high-value services, the ones that generate jobs of that magnitude, they're basically in very, very large cities. Why is it the salaries in New York are twice as high as elsewhere? 
It's that concentration of high-value services which only occurs in high-density, very large cities like a London or a Tokyo or Paris, boom, 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 a Hong Kong or Singapore. Now, part of the problem in China is that if you encourage only urbanization in small and medium cities, you get basically low-value services. That's okay when you're relatively poor. It's not okay when your income is upper middle and you're trying to go develop. So China has to realize that the so-called high-value jobs require much bigger cities. They require specialized cities. Now, they then require usually much more innovation, much more risk-taking, and therefore private players usually are able to break into the what I call the higher value services easier and better than the state. And that's why I think the third plan talks about opening up services for investment, whether it's health, education, entertainment, and financial. If you go to China today, you'll see there are many, many people, for example, who want to open hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living. China is aging. People have lots of money. They want to spend it on this thing, but most of these hospitals are under investment and inefficient. But you have to pass through all sorts of regulations to open up and expand these kinds of hospitals. They're controlled by the state. You eliminate that regulation, you're going to see an enormous increase in health investment in China. IT, mobile, software, controlled by dominant Chinese companies. They're growing very, very rapidly. So people say, why do I need to liberalize? It's growing very, very rapidly. The reality is if you liberalize that sector, it'll grow even more rapidly, and it'll move into kinds of things which the state doesn't really want to get into because it can make so much money from what it's already doing. So you liberalize, allow the private that comes in, you allow urbanization to play its role. Education is a trickier issue. China's graduating eight times as many college graduates as it did 10 years ago. The salaries, the salaries of college graduates have declined so that they're no longer any different from the salaries of high school students. So many people think that college graduates are China's strength in the future, yet they have the same kind of problem we have in the United States. Our college graduates here can't find jobs. It is kind of ironic that both China and the United States have the same kind of a problem, that college graduates cannot find jobs. But the reason for that is quite different. You graduate from a high school in China, there are multiple people who want to hire you. You graduate from college in China, and you're struggling to find a job. Part of it is the fact they've actually increased their education enrollment at the higher levels more rapidly than they should have. And secondly, the nature of those kinds of jobs have been increasing as rapidly as it should, have, should be. And the third is the state pays too much. State enterprises and areas pay too much and they're too secure. So no one wants to go into these service kinds of activities or risk or start up their own things. But if you change that structure, then more and more college graduates will realize that the future lies in them creating or doing their own things rather than trying to find a job with a state enterprise. And then if they do, they'll create their own jobs and their own demands. So it has to be part of what I call a changing structure of the Chinese economy. Was there a question over here? Over there? Yes. Let's win one more, and then we'll have to stop. Thank you. Um, my question is in regards to your second theme, um, making SOEs more competitive. Yes. Uh, was there any language uh, coming out of the third plenum about how you think China is going to address that? First thing I would do is encourage you to read Vikram Nehru's 2030 report, and there's a chapter there about SOEs and private, private enterprises. This uh, 2030 report produced through the government talks about changing the ownership structure and the management structure of the state sector, separate ownership, operating functions, and therefore trying to get around some of these incentive problems that we've just discussed. The second kind of question would be opening up or allowing private enterprises to operate in sectors which are currently totally monopolies for the SOEs. The third thing, I think, is, is probably to me um, more significant, that you get these state enterprises out of there. You allow bankruptcies and closures. You basically declare that there's no logic in SOEs in certain areas. And then I think the fourth thing basically is you start taking away the surpluses of state enterprises and moving into the budget. SOEs perpetuate themselves because they don't pay dividends in the same form. 
They generate monopoly profits. They're either able to expand or they actually go into other areas which they shouldn't even be going into. And there's no logic in that. So take away their surpluses, a lot more competition, close, and change the ownership operation structure of these SOEs. Those are the kinds of ideas that people are wrestling with. They're all politically sensitive and difficult, though. One last question, we got to leave. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. It just comes off your last remark. Uh, you've described what could and should be done, broadly speaking, but will it happen? Does the leadership share have the insights, the determination, the ability to make these things happen, or will bureaucratic muddle, uh, inertia, resistance from SOEs or others uh, halt or prevent it? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think anyone does. I think I was surprised by the nature of the third plenum decision note. I thought it was path-breaking, comprehensive logic. It, for such a huge document, it's only 10 pages. I mean, the 12th five-year plan is hundreds of pages. So this is very pithy. So you have 60, 60 decisions, 16 sections. They're all in there. So I thought, compared to the summary statement, which went, came out a week or two before, which was, I thought, very poorly done, the decision note was quite well done. So I think... I think the other issue that's interesting is I think the president really wants to see himself in the same mold as a transformative leader like Deng Xiaoping. And I think that's his model. He wants to be known as someone who changed the nature of China. And we know that leadership matters, so it's up to him. Now, that he put himself in charge of these two committees, you can see it very positively. If things don't work, he's responsible, right? If he puts somebody else in charge, he could say whatever. So that's a good sign. It's actually, however, potentially a bad sign. Because you don't usually put the head of the state in charge of these kinds of committees. You usually try to get somebody else. But I think what he's signaling is there's a problem. The problem is vested interests in politics are so severe that I have to get involved. Now, he is signaling something which I think is kind of interesting. The structure of these two committees basically signify a, a change, and the change is the party dominates. The government is less important. For better or for worse, that to me is a very complicated, interesting issue because he now thinks you cannot get reform through the government apparatus. The prime ministers, ministers, deputy prime ministers, whatever. Too much vested interest, too many cones and cylinders, you have to get it through the party. That is certainly different from what's been happening in the last couple decades. Now, what that tells me is that he's committed and he wants to do something. It doesn't answer your question. Well, it happened. But I think he also, and they've also realized this is a 10-year agenda. It's not a one-year agenda. I think that's sensible, too. So I'm encouraged by certain signals, but I'm also like you. I don't know whether it's going to happen or not. But they've created a potential possibility for it to happen, and they recognize that these you know, political issues are serious. Okay? Thank you very much.